After 15 years of planning and preparing for unique achievements within RuneScape, I have finally decided to take on a new challenge which will put all this experience to test. This challenge is that of completing quests, minigames, and any other achievement in game with high tier restrictions and bare minimum requirements. All to be done on a hardcore Iron Man, meaning I can lose my status and end the series at any time. But that's not all. The larger challenge here is that I can only be using raw potatoes as a consumable food, and therefore I welcome you to my new series. Potato only, hardcore Iron Man. Hello everyone and welcome to episode 3. The last episode included me completing underground pass with just 10 HP, 1 defense, 1 prayer, and even 1 agility. Today's episode though will be a little bit more relaxed with just the account status and preparation for the next major quest in line. Although it will be a little bit more relaxed, this is because the progression of the account itself is quite grindy and I will be sharing little tips and tricks along the way, so just stay tuned. Today though we will still be analyzing some weird quest mechanics along with unique tips which you can catch during the phase of this progression on the account. This week's episode includes around 40 hours of preparation just to get my account ready for the next major achievement in line. So if you guys enjoy the unique aspects of this series along with the hours of dedication input into each episode, it would really help me out if you want to subscribe. So many of you noticed in the previous episode we obviously got agility XP at the end of Underground Pass, making us no longer want agility. That is because I really only wanted the one agility restriction actually for Underground Pass quest as it is the only quest in the game with high level agility obstacles but no actually level of agility required to start the quest. So as you can see here we're just starting off picking some potatoes because Underground Pass literally wiped my food clear out of my bank and I needed some more food to do the next few quests. So in this episode I wanted to finish Death to Dorgashin along with a bunch of other low tier quests in order to maybe make some money now that I have agility and now that I can get agility through these quests. Now currently I have 10 HP as a restriction on the build so I needed a cannon to do more difficult quests in order to continue on with the series. So right off the bat I go ahead and start Ruin Mysteries quest as it is required for Death to Dorgashin. If you guys didn't know you can actually use the start of this quest to go ahead and get multiple air talismans in order to make air tiaras at low level rune crafting for ironmen and boost your stat pretty quickly. From here I went to the top of the Lumbridge gates in front of the Lumbridge courtyard in order to get a bronze pickaxe to start on that mining requirement for the lost tribe quest, but luckily I already had at least 15 mining from previous quests so I just needed a little bit of a boost. So from here I took that bronze pickaxe, went to the Faldor mines in order to get the ores for dorks quest and used that quest to boost my mining just up to level 17 from 15. So another quest requirement for the Lost Tribe is actually Goblin Diplomacy, and if you guys didn't know you can actually get the 3 pieces of Goblin Mail if you're trying to stay 10 HP like me from 3 crates around the area. While gathering the dyes for Goblin Diplomacy I noticed the cooking shop in Port Serum is also probably one of the most useful shops for the level Iron Man. Here you can get red berries for the dye for Goblin Diplomacy quest as well as red berries for the pie for Knight's Sword quest as well as be able to get raw chicken and raw beef for part of Druidic Ritual, as well as another raw beef to go ahead and burn for the Witch's Potion quest. Now I know that sounds like a lot, but there was even more like the flour for instance for Cook's Assistant. So I will tell you, hats off to the chef there. So while I was in this area, I wanted to go ahead and kill a giant rat, but without getting combat XP, so I went ahead and used the first tick of the NPC to get no EXP by stalling it with an interface and using an alt account. I went ahead and did the same for the smaller level rat in Remington in order to get the rat's tail for Witch's Potion quest. This is because I would need some magic XP to enchant recoils later on. So I actually needed a light source of some sort in order to do Lost Tribe quest. So I booked it over to Yanil and bought a torch from the hunter shop as well as some other various items I would need for future quests in the area. Finally I could go ahead and start Lost Tribe quest which is a major requirement for Death to Dorshin. Did you guys know that before getting the quick follow option while traversing the mines, you can actually go ahead and just click the minimap in order to mitigate most of the traps in the area. So I made it through the mines with ease on my hardcore and went ahead and finished the quest. Next I had to spend a few hours at the ham hideout in order to collect the two full sets of ham robes to use for the death to Dorgashin quest. I also ended up doing an easy clue from the ham hideout just to see my luck. And lastly went ahead and got the remaining agility requirement for the Death to Dorgashin quest start. I also met someone along the way who seemed like he might need some help, so why not? 
People like this is what keeps the real nostalgia going. Finally, we've made it to the Death to Dorgishin quest start. I decided I kind of wanted to QA test this entire quest unofficially, and all the bugs you will see in this quest have been reported actually multiple times across multiple accounts. Nothing major was found or will be displayed, but the lack of QA support in recent updates is kind of what gave me this idea. So actually in this quest there aren't that many bugs that are left unpatched until we get to the very end. With the exception of being able to get out of the castle with Xanik even realizing where he is till later, as well as the ability to take Xanik to Alcarid with the grapple to the southeast and being able to null him there. So like I said, most of the bugs that were worth mentioning weren't really found until right before the boss fight and the end of the quest. So one of the first things I saw towards the end of the quest was this NPC who carries the crate seems to have a force movement property whenever you just try to talk to him. This even works through objects in his pathway but fortunately there aren't many of those to deal with. Next I noticed the trap door which is an object is actually an object you can just go ahead and stand on because there is no invisible force tile there to block you. So next I went ahead and put Xanik in the crate and went down into the boss area. From here I actually noticed that the boss area was privately instanced. Before entering a private instance, the game tracks your coordinate location that you entered that instance on. And when you log out of an instance, you are reloaded back on the coordinates from which you entered the instance originally. So re-logging after starting the boss fight actually put the leveled Xanic character as a follower whenever I logged back in. Unfortunately though, this NPC did not act like it did in the instance and would not attack other NPCs which were aggressive to me. Although, this NPC wasn't coded to handle what the original Xanik was, and when putting it in chat dialogues it typically handled, it tended to null the entire NPC itself. And honestly, just seeing how it acted in some of these instances was actually pretty comedic to me. So one of the last things I wanted to see was, what happens if you go down the trap door when Xanik's supposed to follow you, if you already have a follower out? It turns out, Xanik just straight up disappears, and you just have a cat which talks like Xanik, but doesn't act like him. So I wondered what would happen if I just went back up the stairs and went through the dialogue where Xanik typically stops following you at that part of the quest. Well, come to find out, your pet actually gets deleted and you cannot call it back with a whistle, and you can't even get it back if you relog. so it's a good thing I didn't do this with an actual boss pet. Now at this part of the quest you would figure I would just kill Sigmund and complete the quest, but unfortunately I had about 20 more hours of work to do prior. I would either need a poisoned weapon or recoils to kill the boss because a cannon actually can't be set up down here in the watermill as it says the soil is too damp to set up a cannon. As well, this is a private instance so I can't have the help of any alternate accounts like I did in the underground path. So I had two choices, I could either kill the boss with poison or with recoils. Now the only real effective way to get poison at this level on an Iron Man is to risk my entire hardcore status by going to rogues in deep wilderness in order to pickpocket an iron dagger poisoned. So the obvious answer for me here was to actually get Rings of Recoil. So once I was actually going to complete the quest, my plan was to go to the ham storeroom in order to get jewelry and sell it for money for a cannon. I got luckier than expected here, and it turns out if you do the private instance part of this quest, once you have completed just that instance, you are able to use the real ham storeroom in order to access the keys. So therefore I didn't even need the quest complete to get my money making method, but I always finish what I started anyways. As well as getting access to the real ham storeroom where you pickpocket ham members for the keys to open the chest, you actually get many pieces of jewelry, some which are sapphire rings, which I would later use cosmics with in order to make rings of recoil. So finding out that I didn't even need to complete the quest in order to access this content was one of the most win-win things I've ever realized throughout the progression of this account. But first, I needed to get a lot more food from all the damage I would take pickpocketing these ham guards. So Hudo on the second floor of the Grand Tree actually sells the largest stock I could find of potatoes and they're all just one coin each. This seemed to be the fastest way possible to acquire sacks of potatoes as there was a bank just a few feet away as well. Unfortunately though, needing as many as 4,000 potatoes or 400 sacks for this entire thieving process, I would need to spend almost 4 hours here gathering these supplies. Now back at the ham guards in the ham storeroom, I spent around 16 hours pickpocketing and looting chests in order to get the cash for my cannon. If you guys have ever heard of tabling, it's actually a technique used by a lot of ultimate ironmen. You can actually set items on a table which will allow them to not despawn for 10 minutes versus 2 minutes on the floor. 
Luckily, there's a table in the back of the ham storeroom, which allows me to put my sacks of potatoes on the table in order to not lose them from despawn after spending several hours gaining them from the shop. This is because the chests sometimes give multiple pieces of jewelry which easily overflows my inventory. There is also two chests in the back of the ham storeroom by this table which actually uses steel keys to grant loot so I don't actually have to pickpocket a fourth door in the ham area. So finally again after around 16 hours of thieving ham guards for keys I had around 750k to work with for a cannon and cannonballs. This was gained by getting high elk value for my jewelry and gems by selling them to the gem shop in Falador and the jewelry shop in Port Serum. Next I did the dwarf cannon quest and used my 700k to purchase a cannon, as well as did the knight's sword quest in order to get a head start on smithing for those cannonballs I would later need. Now I still needed some more smithing XP to get 36 smithing to smith cannonballs, so I headed to Motherload Mine, where I went ahead and fixed the water mills in each world for a small grant of smithing XP. From here I found myself starting the giant dwarf quest in order to access blast furnace, and make around 220 steel bars before losing my entire cash stack. From here I used these steel bars in order to make some cannonballs to where I had around 800 cannonballs banked for future quests. So now I had my cannon and cannonballs in order to pursue more advanced quests in the future of the series. But I said I always finish what I started and I needed recoils in order to kill Sigmund and go ahead and finish Death to Dorgishin. Unfortunately, the only really safe way to enchant my rings and get cosmics would be that of doing the feud quest, or that of killing NPCs and using many, many cannonballs. Neither of which I had the time or patience to really want to do. So what did we do instead? We took a risk. I decided to go for the Mage Bank shop and buy the cosmics there. Shout out to my friend Zarge here who actually didn't decide to pull out a DFS spec and kill me and end the entire series. Instead I had him box me the whole way to the mage bank so I couldn't be attacked by other players since it's single way combat. So there you have it I made it to the mage bank and got my cosmic safe and sound. From here I went in and enchanted the recoils so I would have those for this quest as well as others in the future. From here I went to the combat training grounds which you get access to once completing Biohazard, where I got an extra attack level to maybe increase my chances at hitting Sigmund. Now 20 hours later I'm back and ready to complete the quest. I went ahead and grabbed aggression from Sigmund's followers in order for Xanak to kill them while I safe spotted them to clear the room and only have to deal with Sigmund alone. Next I lined Sigmund up behind Xanak, then pulled him over to the safe spot in the northeast corner of the room. From here I would continuously step out and allow for Sigmund to hit me in order to recoil his hits and then move back behind the sacks and eat to full with potatoes. Finally after eating literally an entire inventory besides one sack of potatoes, I had gotten Sigmund down to zero health. But zero health doesn't actually mean I've cleared the boss. As you can see you actually need to do physical damage to Sigmund besides the recoil itself or else he won't teleport away and you can't complete the quest. Oddly enough he has a very weird null effect where he will be able to hit you but not do damage and you won't be able to attack him at all if he is down to zero health with no physical damage done. Therefore I purposely recoiled his health down to zero first in order for his HP to regen back to one and only be able to hit a one as the final blow resulting in the least amount of HP XP possible from this boss kill. And there you have it, now we finish Death to Dorgashin, along with getting a cannon, recoils, and even cannonballs. For the next episode, you can expect the cannon to be used in killing bosses for many subquests. I hope you all enjoyed the video. If you did, drop me a subscribe, and I hope you all have a wonderful day.